So, Pastor Fleming, if you weren't here last week, led an excellent Bible study on Daniel chapter 6 to my great disappointment because I wanted to teach Daniel chapter 6. I was very, I, to, be, to be frank, I think he probably did a better job than I did. But I was really looking forward to that chapter, but of course I was, I was at home sick still. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to, to watch it yet, please go back and watch it. Um, the, he has some really applicable information and comfort to us for our day. Okay? I, I think you should teach Daniel 7. <laughs> but I prepared Daniel 7. <laughs> so I'll teach that instead. Oh, it's okay. Uh, COVID. Let's be done with that whole thing. Um, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, doing a little bit of setup. Uh, what we're going to talk about first is the kind of the historical setting. Uh, second, four things to listen for as we read through the whole chapter. And I'll go ahead and remind you of those again next week. Okay. Uh, and then third, we're going to look at a connection to Dan Daniel chapter 2, and then finally we'll get into the text itself, okay? So the historical setting um, is approximately 553 to 550 B.C., uh, when Daniel has the vision that's recorded here in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, the, the person who's identified as being the king is Belshazzar, king of Babylon, uh, he's actually the son of uh, Nabadinius, uh, who is currently in exile. Uh, he's actually in voluntary exile, and he's ceded the kingdom over to his son, getting ready to come back when people aren't so angry with him. Okay? So, well, what a way to rule a nation, right? So, if, if people, if your, your presidential approval rating gets really low... You're just like, I'm going to cede things over to my son who's going to come in and rule for me for a little while, and then I'll come back after my voluntary exile, and I'm sure everything's going to be okay. Uh, probably not, by the way. In fact, uh, he ends up ruling uh, until 539 when he is overthrown by Cyrus. Uh, his kingdom is conquered, and um, I, I'm not sure what happens to him, but my guess is I, I, I'd probably have him killed. So, if I were a ruthless uh, Persian or Mede, right, but I'm not, I'm actually forgiving, so I'd, I'd probably say go back into exile. <clears throat> so, so, in other words, this, is, this, is, this chapter is earlier than chapter 6 and 5. Mm -hmm. Right, and it also serves as a, a pivot between the chapters uh, where we've, we've heard about Daniel's life in the court, and now these are Daniel's visions from here on out, okay? So we're, we're no longer going to hear from, from like King Nebuchadnezzar and his dreams. Instead, this is Daniel and his, his dreams through chapter 12. Uh, it also serves as a pivot in the language that it's written in. Uh, prior to this, things have been written in Aramaic, and now we are going to, to uh, have things written in Hebrew, uh, which again reflects on then who is receiving the vision, uh, not these Gentile rulers, but Daniel the Jew. Okay, So we have those, those two things pivoting. The other thing that's really substantial here and, and why we'll end up spending two days is that it is at this point you hear great detail about the Messiah who is to come, okay? And much of that is set up in chapter 7, okay? So uh, that gives us a little bit of the historical setting then of Daniel chapter 7. Uh, we note that it is similar to Daniel chapter 2, okay? Remember the vision from Daniel chapter 2? Nebuchadnezzar had this, this vision of a giant statue and there were four substantial parts to it gold and silver and um, then bronze and iron slash clay do you remember what that stood for or at least the conclusion we came to <clears throat> yeah four kingdoms four kingdoms the first of those being the the present kingdom of the babylonians the final kingdom being that of the roman empire Okay, so we're going to hear about four kingdoms again today, 
in these four beasts. That also marks a, a pretty substantial difference from chapter 2. Prior to this, uh, you know, oh, we've got this beautiful statue, but then it all crumbles. Um, but now we've got these beasts that are doing, well, beastly things because they're animals. And one of them, in fact, goes around devouring. Yikes. Okay? So in comparison between these two visions, this one is much more frightening based on the beasts. There is great comfort here, too. Now, what are we going to listen to or listen for? Four things. First, as we hear uh, chapter 7, we do hear from God that he is the one who makes kingdoms to rise or to fall. He is the one who orders human history. And we heard that in, of course, the, the Gospel of Luke at Christmas, right? When Jesus was born, it was at a certain place at a certain time under certain rulers, like when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So God is ordering human history, um, not just in, in some type of way in order to bring about an earthly kingdom, but instead to bring, out, bring about an eternal reign and to bring you into it. So it's about your salvation and redemption. Okay, so that's the first thing we're listening for. Uh, second, it becomes explicit in this chapter that we're listening uh, for, that we're hearing about a Messiah, one who is like a son of man. And when we hear that, by the way, the, the son of man, uh, this is not simply saying like the son of Monty Bell. Nathaniel Bell, he's the son of man, right? Well, no. Um, while, while in the book of Ezekiel, the title son of man is used 93 times to refer to Ezekiel, uh, outside of that, one like a son of man, especially in the book of Daniel, is talking about someone who is greater than simply a prophet. Thus, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, uh, we hear about this one like a son of man, who has the kingdom of this world, which has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever, Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. Um, this kingdom, by the way, is one that will have no end. So that's the third thing, okay? So we hear about a kingdom that shall have no end, um, and that plays well when we're hearing uh, from Jesus as he talks to Peter about the keys of the kingdom, and we'll give you the keys of the kingdom and not even hell shall prevail over it. Okay? This kingdom becomes the kingdom of you, the saints. Right? This is what we hear about extensively in the book of Revelation, as well as elsewhere in the Holy Scriptures, that the kingdom that is the son of man's is, in fact, your kingdom. And then finally, in this chapter, we hear about the two advents of Christ. So it seems like we should have gotten to this particular chapter about three or four weeks ago when it was still Advent, but, well, here we are. We're going to hear about uh, Christ coming and then Christ's return. So with that bit of setup, let's hear a little bit from uh, Daniel chapter 7 and this vision that Daniel has. So we're at verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lift, lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the man, mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up to one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. 
And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words of the horn that was speaking. As I looked, the beast was killed, its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Thus far the text, and I think we can all go home. We've heard enough. But in all seriousness, there's so much here, right? Um, and, and much of it is symbolic. So we have to understand what it's pointing to. So first off, we hear about uh, four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. These four winds are representative of the four ends of the earth. Okay, So all of the earth is being troubled by these winds. Well, what is the sea? Uh, sometimes that's been interpreted as the Mediterranean Sea because of its uh, locality, central location. Uh, but this also could be the peoples of the earth being stirred up by these winds. The result of the winds is that four kingdoms arise, okay, from out, from amongst the peoples. The four kingdoms include a lion, a bear, a leopard, and one that's undescribed, right? Other than having teeth like iron. It's just a beast with ten horns. Yikes. Uh, sometimes the imagination does far more than words can do. It's kind of like when, when Samuel is going upstairs to bed right now. Uh, he says, somebody come with me. Well, why? So with Samuel, up to this point, he hasn't been afraid of the dark. In fact, once I found him in the basement, digging into some ice cream in the, in the deep freeze, in the dark. He hadn't turned on any lights. But there he was. Isn't that funny? But now he goes upstairs and he says, ah, ah, I need somebody to come with me. I'm scared. Imagination. Sometimes it's very perilous. Now, getting to this, this first kingdom, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And then its wings get plucked off and it's lifted from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man is given to it. Um, the lion has already been identified by the prophet Jeremiah prior to Daniel. And that's referring to the kingdom of Babylon. In fact, it refers specifically to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the speed at which it moves is pretty fast because it's got wings, but those wings are plucked off. And in fact, what you note historically is from Nebuchadnezzar on, the expansion of the Babylonian kingdom reduces greatly. Okay? And so its wings are plucked off. It's no longer rapidly moving through the world, destroying things. It's made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man is given to it. Well, think about Nebuchadnezzar. What happens to him? 
he ends up being um, uh, kind of in this state uh, of being a, not a xenophile, but, but basically being an animal for a, a short period of time, right? So, uh, a a well, a longhorn. Anyway, so uh, there, there you have it, right? This is a description of Nebuchadnezzar, but in, in very uh, kind of apoc apocalyptic terms, much like the book of Revelation. When you read Revelation, you're not reading it to find out a literal uh, account of how things are going to end. Instead, there, there are all these levels of figurative language, of metaphor in there, and you have, to, you have to pick out what exactly do these things mean. How do you figure that out? In part, by going to the rest of the scriptures when things are especially confusing. Especially going to this book of Daniel, by the way. Because this is informative to our understanding of the book of Revelation. We'll see some connections there in a little bit. Okay, the second kingdom, a bear. God raises up a bear, right? A, a bear that already has something in its mouth, ribs or, or teeth or something in its mouth that it's eating, okay? Um, the, the description is, is kind of interesting because you, you wonder at first, is it a deformed bear? Because it's raised up to one side, okay? But the, the verb that's used here is a passive verb, as if God is raising up this kingdom. Okay? Uh, secondly, uh, we, we have this matter of, of three ribs already. So it's already conquering kingdoms, and then it's given more. Okay? Uh, sometimes those three ribs are interpreted as the, the three great uh, cities that are conquered by the Persian kingdom, uh, including Lydia and then the kingdom of Babylon, and then Egypt. Now, whether we can make that connection effectively or not is another story. Uh, but I think what we can say is, instead of hearing that it has 10 ribs in its mouth, which represents a, a number of completion, three is far less. So there's a short amount of rule and a limited amount of power given to this kingdom, okay? So thus far, we've had the lion, which is Babylon, and we've had the bear, which is Persia. The third kingdom that arises, a leopard with four wings and four heads. Before this, we heard about the lion with wings and talked about how that emphasizes the speed with which uh, Babylon once conquered and then kind of slowed down. In this case, we're looking at the kingdom of Alexander the Great, okay? Now, historically, I, I'm sure, uh, let's, how many historians know how quickly Alexander the Great conquered stuff? Mr. Roberts, where are you when I need you? Oh, fixing your computer. Thank you, Mr. Roberts, for doing another noble vocation. We need another historian, though, I guess. Okay, so uh, Alexander the Great... Uh, conquers a massive amount of territory in a decade, in 10 years, uh, in, including then the, the kingdom of, of uh, Macedonia, uh, the Medes, um, and he ends up conquering his, his uncle, okay? Uh, and and uh, I don't know what happens to his uncle either. It's kind of frightening. Uh, but, but he manages to conquer a large territory in a short period of time. The four heads represents then the, the expanse of the kingdom. Alexander the Great has the greatest expanse of kingdom during that, that time period. This, by the way, will end up playing into Daniel's visions in both chapter 8 as well as 10 to 12. So we'll hear about Alexander the Great again at that point. Uh, the final beast that's mentioned, the beast of Rome, okay? Ten horns indicates the power with which they have. Um, they're, it's a quite powerful kingdom. Not complete power, but greater than any other nation on earth up to that point, it seems. <clears throat> this beast uh, it ends up having an 11th horn, a little horn, which has eyes and speaks. We'll hear in, later in this particular chapter, in chapter 7, 
that uh, the, the horn that is speaking is in fact speaking against the saints. And so this, this horn is representative of the Antichrist. And that plays into the book of Revelation. Uh, specifically, uh, we hear about a beast that Satan forms in chapter 13 uh, and who's raised up to attack the saints. Okay? So there we have now the, the four beasts identified. The kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of the lion. The second kingdom, the kingdom of the bear, which was the kingdom of Persia. The third kingdom, the kingdom of Alexander the Great, the leopard. And then the final one, the beast, which devours, uh, and that is Rome. And Rome is by no, no means a peaceful ruling uh, nation, right? Uh, consider what they do to Jerusalem after the rebellion in, in uh, 70 AD, right? They, com they completely ransack it, tearing down not just the walls, but also even destroying the massive temple, okay? So Rome is a nation that destroys. After having said all of this, kind of a frightening vision, but then there's hope in verses 9 through 14. So Daniel looks, there are thrones placed, the Ancient of Days takes his seat, and later on the Son of Man comes. So um, we want to consider then who these two characters are, these two individuals, the Ancient of Days as well as the Son of Man. And then from there, we want to consider what happens at this, in this court, specifically a court of judgment, because we hear about that in verse 10, where the books happen to be open. Okay, so we know that one of those thrones is set up for the Ancient of Days. Who is the Ancient of Days? Now, most of us would immediately jump to the conclusion that this is, oh, yes, it's God. But if you were to identify a person of the Trinity, you would probably say, some might say God the Son. And in fact, that holds with some Christian tradition, okay? Others might say God the Father. And that actually is part of the kind of the more ancient tradition of the Christian church. Okay? So uh, others, by the way, there's, there's a third option, God in general. This just represents God. Okay? Um, why might we go with God the Father versus God the Son? It all has to do with that title, the Son of God man okay and who does christ say that he is repeatedly he talks about himself as the son of man okay so it what we can conclude from that is that this ancient of days is god the father and then the uh the second individual the son of man is then this uh christ jesus now are there writings outside of um, this, outside of Daniel, which would support that? In fact, rabbinic tradition uh, always talks about how, how this, this section where there are thrones placed for the Ancient of Days, that is not just one throne for the Ancient of Days, but another throne that's placed for the heir of David. Okay? So the Jews already see this as being kind of a messianic throne. Or a messianic figure. Okay? Now, um, we don't pull our theology from rabbinic sources. As Monty Bell and I were talking about after church today, he said, well, I don't think Jesus was sitting there talking about the Talmud and rabbinic tradition with, uh, with the teachers in the temple. I think they, they were probably talking about the scriptures. And I said, I think you're right, Monty. I think you're right. Okay? So um, consider then for a moment something like Psalm 110. Verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, yep, sit at my right hand until make your enemies your footstool. Okay, that's David who's prophesying about his heir. Jesus later applies that verse to himself, saying, how can David say, the Lord said to my Lord, come sit at my right hand? Unless he's talking about the Lord. Okay? So, 
When we have those two pieces put together, what becomes clear is that we've got one throne for God the Father, one throne for God the Son. The thing is, it doesn't say two thrones, it just says thrones in general. Are there other thrones that are involved here? Yes. Consider what Jesus says to his own disciples when he talks about the kingdom of God. There are going to be some thrones placed there for whom? The apostles. Okay? And in fact, in the book of Revelation, it talks about 24 thrones. So is that then the patriarchs of the Old Testament and the apostles? Makes sense. So there are all these thrones set up in judgment. In comes the Ancient of Days, who has clothes as white as snow and hair like pure wool, identifying God's holiness on a flaming throne because God comes as a purifying fire. And it has wheels. This thing is tricked out. Wow. Um, what in the world is going on with that? Why wheels? Because uh, prior to this, there aren't all these visions of God going around on a throne with wheels. When God is seen, for instance, in the, the vision of Isaiah, he's seen in the temple. So what's up with the throne on wheels? <laughs> the Pope Mobile. He's also got a, you know, a bulletproof cap on the top. It's great. The, the answer, dear Christians, is God continues to go with his people. His presence is with them even in exile. Oh, how comforting then Daniel's vision would be for these people who are separated from the temple and where God is supposed to be. Well, good news. God is going with you. And that's the good news of your baptism, isn't it? This is where we, where we, where we pick this up and say, ah, oh, oh, while I know God is definitely for me over in that church building under bread and wine, he's also promised to go with me in those waters of holy baptism where he said, I join myself to you. And so as you go out into the world, not that you're going into exile like these Israelites did right now. You're already in exile from the promised land. We'll get there eventually. But God is going with you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? So we have great comfort here. Now, uh, we've heard a bit about then this, uh, this throne about God sitting upon his throne, 10,000 times 10,000. Uh, this is a representative number, not a literal number. Uh, we don't end up taking, uh, just, just like we don't end up taking from the book of Revelation, uh, the 12,000 from each tribe as being uh, the limited number of people who will enter into the heavenly kingdom. Well, only 144,000 end up getting in, like Mark Norcross over here is numbered amongst them. I don't know that I am, but uh, good news for Mark, bad news for the rest of us, he knows. Well, no, it's actually a representative number representing completion. The courts in sitting there in judgment and the books are open. The books being the books of, well, there's one book of life wherein your name happens to be written. But then there's also another book, and that comes up again in the book of Revelation. A book which records the, the deeds of those who have no faith. Okay. So that's the other book that's being opened. Hey, good news. The children have come down here to join us for a couple of minutes. So, and the other good news is I'm, I only have a couple more minutes to uh, finish the sheet, and I'm almost done. Whew. Okay. The beasts, verses 11 through 12, they have their kingdoms taken away from them. Though three of them are allowed to endure for a time, a season and a time. But the, the chief one, the beast with the, the talking horn, that beast is killed, its body destroyed, and it's given over to be burned with fire, uh, which is picked up in the book of Revelation when the beast is slain and thrown into the fires. Now, the key part that we want to get to. The night visions talk about the ancient of days having one like a son of man presented before him. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, prior to this last century, this son of man has been traditionally interpreted as the Messiah. But over the last 100, 150 years, 
Critical scholars have talked about how this is either an angel or a collective figure for God's people. Why is this decidedly unsatisfying? First, because Christ already takes this, the title Son of Man and applies it to himself, not to the angels. Second, the author of Hebrews picks up on this as well, talking about the Son of Man, which is this Son of God. And he's actually greater than all of the angels, which is the kind of chief argument in the first few chapters of the book of Hebrews. What about this matter of God's people as a collective? Because you do hear quite a bit about the saints later, and now they're presented with the kingdom. Well, you could conflate the two, I suppose. But again, you're in doing this, you're missing something. You're missing that this body of Christ is made up of Christ himself as the head, and you as the body. So, of course, the kingdom that's presented to the Son of Man is going to be presented to you as well, being part of his body. So, when we hear then this Son of Man, what we're hearing about is Christ Jesus, the true Messiah, who comes for us. And in fact, he takes up this section of Daniel and applies it directly to himself in the presence of the high priest and those who are gathered around to try him in Matthew chapter 26. For he talks about how the Son of Man himself will return with glory in the clouds of the heavens. Quoting from Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. He has been given a dominion, glory, and a kingdom. For he who has risen from the dead has now been given all of these things. All authority in heaven and on earth is now mine. Jesus says to his disciples following his resurrection. So, we have then in this last section before we hear more details about the vision interpreted, a reference to Christ Jesus, the one who comes to vanquish the kingdoms of this world, specifically the kingdom of the devil, the world, and our flesh, and comes to give us an eternal kingdom. So while on the surface Daniel chapter 7 appears to be kind of a frightening chapter initially, my goodness, what comfort as God the Father comes to continue to be with us upon his heavenly throne as the books of judgment are opened and your name is found in the book of life, as Christ, the Messiah, comes and is given eternal dominion in an eternal kingdom that shall not be destroyed. So, that's chapter 7, part 1. My voice held out and so did you. God be praised. Uh, questions? Questions? And yet, sort of, right? Although we're yeah. not to say, but, but when our Lord comes, there's, I mean, you don't match them, but his is not, it doesn't look right. Right. His kingdom becomes a kingdom of comfort. Which that's a real kingdom. Yeah. Behind all these other I suppose that's what we need to see within our society in the present day, right? Because. Things look pretty beastly. But Christ comes as one of us and certainly continues to shield us from the attacks of the devil, care for us throughout, and um, speak to us with his tender voice. That voice that we hear and delight in that tells us, well, you shall never perish and no one can snatch you out of my hand. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O Heavenly Father, that out of your great and abundant mercy you sent forth your only begotten Son to be born of Mary to take on our flesh. He's truly flesh of our flesh, bone of our bones, and has joined himself to us, not only in living out his life in perfect obedience unto you, dying for our sins, 
but also then bringing forth his forgiveness into our lives through holy baptism, your continued word that is preached to us and absolves us of our sins, and in his body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Let us find comfort in, in these things, uh, but then also strengthen us that we may proclaim them to the world around us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.